Our next speaker is someone who I call one of the fathers of RPE. He was one of the four members of Congress who requested the National Academies to write the report that recommended the creation of RPE. He was an original co-sponsor and champion of the America Competes Act which was authorized in 2007 and then reauthorized in 2010. He got the Senate to pass that unanimously and that does not happen every day. He was previously the Secretary of Education and also the Governor of Tennessee. We should be truly grateful for his support of RPE and energy research. Please join me in welcoming Senator Lamar Alexander. Thank you, Arun, and thank you for your tremendous uh, service to our, to our country. My job is to introduce Fred Smith. Fred Smith and ARPA-E are a perfect match. Both believe in innovation. The difference is one has a little more experience than the other. At Yale, Fred wrote a paper, which is pretty well known now, suggesting just-in-time delivery for, computer, for the computer age, which he said probably earned him his usual gentleman's C. In the Marine Corps, he studied the military's logistics system. After Vietnam, he bought some used airplanes and trucks, and he put together Federal Express. Thomas Edison said he failed to succeed, he, Thomas Edison, 10,000 times before he finally produced the light bulb. Fred Smith hasn't known many failures, but like Edison and most daring innovators, he's probably failed to succeed once or twice. For example, in the 1980s, he was trying to figure out how the new fax machine might affect Federal Express, and his conclusion was that customers would walk down to the street corner where there would be a FedEx fax machine and they would send and receive their faxes that way. Well, the fax didn't quite work out that way, but almost all of Fred's other innovations have been enormous successes. He is a rare individual who has not only founded a company, but has stuck with it through all of its iterations until it has grown to be an employer of about 300,000 people in one of the most admired com companies in the world. Today he's still innovating, this time with electric vehicles. I imagine he'll say something about that. Daniel Juergen told a group of us the other day in the Senate that 100 years ago in New York City, there were more electric cars than gasoline-driven cars. Juergen also said that oil today is at its highest price when adjusted by inflation since 1860. And we all know that probably the greatest untapped resource we have in America for energy is the unused electricity that could be generated at night from our existing power plants. So much electricity that if we electrified half our cars and light trucks, we could plug them all in at night at low cost while we sleep without building one new power plant. Ross Perot had basically the same idea in the 1960s when he noticed that the banks in Dallas were locking their doors at 5 o'clock and locking their big new computers inside. So Perot offered to buy cheap computer time at night that wasn't being used, and then he went to governors and said, I can manage your Medicaid data more cheaply, and he made a billion dollars. One of these days, I suspect someone's going to figure out how to make a billion dollars with our unused electrical capacity. Since World War II, it's hard to think of a major advance in the biological or physical sciences that's not been funded at least in part by the federal government, usually through our laboratories and research universities. In that tradition, ARPA-E is a small but exciting agency that can have a huge impact upon our nation's ability to find new sources of cheap, clean, Energy. I'm a strong supporter of ARPA-E, which, as Arun said, came out of the uh, get, Rising Above the Gathering Storm report. And I'm a great admirer of Fred Smith, who is the only person in the world I know who all by himself 
is a walking global economic indicator. Ladies and gentlemen, Fred Smith. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to be here today. Thank you for that kind introduction, Senator Alexander. Not only is Senator Alexander a great United States Senator who's represented our headquarters state of Tennessee ably and well, he's one of the great statesmen of our time, in my opinion. Perhaps even more important, he's a great pianist and entertainer. If you don't believe that, go to YouTube and enter Alexander, comma, Lamar Alfalfa Club, and you'll see what I mean with his performance. I'm very happy and honored to uh, share this stage with uh, my friend Lee Scott. I'm a great admirer of his as a business executive, a great customer of uh, FedEx. But even more importantly, <clears throat> I think when the history books are written about the United States and, in fact, the global transition to a more sustainable world, you'll find his name right at the uh, top echelons of the people who engineered that new world. Now, the mission of uh, ARPA-E uh, is, as I think you know, to uh, reduce energy-related emissions to reduce energy imports and to improve energy efficiency through advanced uh, disruptive technologies. I was introduced to ARPA-E by Senator Alexander and uh, Arun mentioned the fact that he's one of the fathers of this very important initiative. And oftentimes it's been my experience that things that are truly important are not necessarily the biggest in terms of budget, the biggest in terms of the number of people involved, but uh, there are organizations which have a very disproportionate influence uh, on events. And I'm absolutely convinced that uh, Arun and his team fit that category. Now, I became exceedingly interested in this subject a long time ago. In the early days of FedEx, uh, our nascent uh, company was almost killed in the cradle by the first Arab oil embargo. When the price of fuel ran up, the government took over control of uh, the supply of petroleum. You had to receive allocations based on uh, previous usage of petroleum. And of course, with no record of uh, petroleum usage, uh, we had to fight very hard to, uh, to, to get some. So from that point forward, you can imagine uh, it's been a, an issue of exceeding importance to us. Now today, FedEx has four major divisions. Our worldwide express operation, which operates about 700 aircraft. Our ground parcel company, our FedEx freight division, and our retail operation. All told, between our airplanes and our vehicles, which number well in excess of 90,000, of which uh, a quarter or more of the large over-the-road vehicles, the FedEx systems burn well in excess of 1.6 billion gallons of uh, fossil fuels every year. Now, you can do the math. Just drive up to your local gasoline station tonight and... Uh, as Jerry Garcia one time said, to, to paraphrase him, something just got to be done, and it's a damn shame it has to be us to do it. So uh, FedEx, with that level of, of use of fuel and the, and the history that I mentioned to you, became exceedingly interested on what the United States could do uh, about our dependence on uh, imported petroleum. Now, why is that such an issue? As I mentioned, in the early days of FedEx, we had our first exposure to OPEC, which, as you know, is a pricing cartel that manages 
uh, the supply of oil and, and through withholding or adding oil uh, to the global supply uh, attempts to maintain an orderly market. Uh, today, most people think that uh, the Saudis, who have the, the, the lever of the reserve supply, uh, need about $90, $94 a barrel in order to uh, meet their social obligations. Whatever the, the bottom line is on OPEC's uh, pricing outlook, however, I can assure you that the United States cannot operate as a, uh, a growing industrial society without access to uh, low-cost energy. Uh, if you really think about it, the history of the industrial world is the adoption of uh, uh, you know, energy uh, to, to produce wealth and to produce economic activity. To those ends, we burn today about 19 billion barrels of oil per day and of that about 50 to 60 percent of it is imported. Now some of it comes from friendly locations like our neighbors to the north in Canada and our neighbors to the south in in Mexico but the reality is that 90 percent of the worldwide proven oil reserves are owned by national oil companies which in turn are often owned by governments who do not share the same values and whose interests are often inimical to those of the United States. So we at FedEx have long believed that after nuclear proliferation and terrorism, our dependence on this uh, imported petroleum uh, constitutes the country's largest uh, national security risk and our largest economic risk. You'll recall in the summer of 2008, just before the subprime mortgage meltdown, a barrel of oil went up to $147 a barrel. And I think in retrospect it's very clear that that increase in oil prices and the cost of gasoline at the pump was the match that lit the bonfire that brought about the uh, meltdown that uh, created the greatest contraction since the end of World War II. So this is an enormous issue, and as a consequence of that, <clears throat> we became involved uh, with a group of eight retired military uh, uh, senior officers, four-star admirals and generals, whose careers had been largely involved in protecting the oil trade because of this tremendous dependence the United States has on imported petroleum. And we set up, along with uh, about eight uh, CEOs of companies that used a lot of uh, petroleum, like FedEx, UPS, Southwest, Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, and so forth, an Energy Security Leadership Council who, whose mission was to uh, look at this problem and to come up with some recommendations to the uh, President and the Congress of the United States, which we did, and our recommendations uh, which we released in a report in 2007 were one, to maximize United States oil and gas production. Number two, to uh, adopt again uh, fuel efficiency standards for uh, vehicles, which had not been done at that time for uh, almost 15 years. Uh, to uh, continue to research biofuels to the extent that they were commercially uh, uh, feasible and could be uh, drop-in fuels, in other words, mixed in with petroleum so you didn't have to create a, an ex, uh, another infrastructure. And then as a result of uh, our research, um, we continued to, to look at the potential for really transformative technologies to reduce uh, oil consumption in general and, and this dependence on uh, imported petroleum from these very unstable areas of the world where we've fought, as you well know, in the last uh, decade, two shooting wars with uh, 5,000 young men and women uh, uh, killed and thousands more maimed and, and wounded. Uh, and <clears throat> we began to believe strongly 
that the trajectory of lithium ion batteries uh, made electrification of light duty vehicles uh, feasible uh, as another antidote to this enormous drain of U.S. wealth uh, through our uh, imports of, of petroleum. I might add that uh, we spend uh, for this 50 to 60 percent of our petroleum needs, uh, which we've averaged over the, the past 20 years, about $300 billion uh, abroad. Uh, we have <clears throat> engaged in the largest transfer of wealth uh, in the history of the world, from the industrialized West into the oil-producing uh, regions of the world. Again, the methods that are used to uh, manage these oil trades, were they done in the United States, would, would get you a, a prison sentence. It is a cartel, and there is no free market uh, for petroleum in the world. As a consequence, the United States cannot solve the problem solely on the basis of market forces uh, coming up with a, with a solution. So as I mentioned, uh, the recommendations of the Energy Security Leadership Council added electrification in 2009 to the panoply of things we recommended to the, to the President and the Congress, and we continue to believe that the potential to reduce the amount of fuel that's burned by our light duty fleet of about 250 million vehicles uh, largely centers on the introduction of cost-effective electric vehicles. We at FedEx are uh, operating a number of them today. They're very exciting uh, for a very simple reason. They cost about uh, 75 to 80 percent less per mile to operate than an internal combustion uh, counterpart. Now, I did not say 7 or 8 percent. I said 75 to 80 percent less cost per mile to operate. So the issue at this point, because the distribution system, the basic distribution system of power generation in the United States already exists, as Senator Alexander mentioned, uh, is to uh, get the cost of, of batteries uh, to the point where the capital cost of the vehicle is competitive with an internal combustion uh, engine. I was very excited when I uh, heard of the uh, uh, press announcement by uh, NVIA, I hope I uh, pronounced the company's name right, uh, yesterday, uh, which is a company that was funded in part by ARPA-E and by uh, private funds that seems to have had a significant breakthrough in battery density and uh, cost performance. It's also uh, funded in part by General Motors, and that's significant in itself because, as you know, General Motors has introduced the transformative Volt, and so there's a high likelihood that this breakthrough in battery technology within the next several years will be incorporated into production vehicles. On an equivalently exciting basis, I think, is the, uh, the uh, technology over the last few years in natural gas production in the United States that has taken our reserves from uh, just a few years ago, estimated to be about 15 years at current uh, consumption rates to over 200 years at current uh, production rates. And as a consequence of that, the price of natural gas has reached a point where it is highly attractive relative to the equivalent of a uh, barrel of oil. Many people, including Boone Pickens and, and uh, uh, a number of other uh, folks have, have strongly advocated that natural gas be used as a transportation fuel. And we agree that there is a great deal of merit in that uh, for uh, long haul uh, large uh, trucks because the, or heavy vehicles used for things like uh, waste disposal, buses, and so forth, because the capital cost of the uh, liquid natural gas distribution can be absorbed over uh, a relatively small number of refueling stations as opposed to trying to put an entirely new distribution system in for light duty vehicles, 
which seem to us are uh, better done by improved internal combustion engines and electrification. But this is a very exciting uh, uh, avenue for a reduction of U.S. Uh, energy consumption in general and reduction in foreign imports for a very uh, important uh, reason that's just happened in the last year or so, and that is for the first time there are LNG engines by Cummins and uh, Navistar that appear to be quite competitive uh, with internal combustion engines given the differential between the cost of natural gas now and a, a, a gallon of diesel. So we are uh, exploring that and we'll have our first uh, prototypical uh, long-haul uh, trucks with 11.9 liter LNG engines on the road uh, this summer. So um, I think that for the first time in my business career, having watched this from 1973 and the first uh, oil embargo to the present time, there is a real chance that the United States, through this new technology that's producing natural gas and oil in the United States, uh, and through the electrification of light-duty transportation, we have a chance to uh, significantly reduce our energy intensity, to reduce the balance of payments and this transfer of wealth that the United States has been involved in for the uh, uh, last 30 uh, to 40 years, uh, to reduce our involvement in the Middle East in terms of protecting the oil trades. Uh, the best estimates are that we spend uh, between 65 and 80 billion dollars of our military budget every year just to protect the oil trades and that doesn't even count as I mentioned the the tremendous uh, expenditure of blood and treasure this country has expended over the last decade with the military operations in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, which were directly related to our dependence on foreign petroleum so we're very uh, supportive of the uh, significant work that uh, is being done by uh, ARPA-E and the leverage uh, that it offers for uh, uh, conceptual breakthroughs that are between the lab and commercialization. And I think uh, that uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel, as I mentioned for the first time in, in my business career, and it's exciting uh, to be here and to, to, to be a small part of, uh, of uh, the, the work that's being done by a lot of people in the audience to achieve these important objectives. Thank you very much.